For the last few weeks, I've been feeling very strongly impressed to preach about my favorite subject in the Bible. Now, a lot of you that know me probably think that my favorite subject in the Bible is creation. And I love Genesis chapter 1, and I love talking about teaching creation, but that's not my favorite subject. Some of you may think that my favorite subject is heaven, and man alive, do I ever love heaven, can't wait to go to heaven, and I want to take a whole busload of y'all with me when I go to heaven. But that's not my favorite subject to preach about. So my wife over here, she thinks my favorite subject to preach about, my favorite topic in the Bible, is sin. And let me tell you why that is. This past Friday, at work, one of Aaron's co-workers comes up to her and says, Oh, Dr. Chambers, Dr. Chambers, I just heard your husband preaching on the radio, and I just loved his message. Aaron naturally said, well, what message did he preach? She said, well, I don't know, but it was the one where he was really talking about sin. And she said, honey, my husband preaches on sin every Sunday. That don't make no <laughs> if you had to nail me down and say, Philip, what is your favorite subject in the whole Bible? I would have to tell you that it's the cross. My favorite subject in the Bible is the cross. You see, church, the miracles and healings of Jesus are great. I love reading where he fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. I love how he healed blind Bartimaeus, the man with the withered hand, and the woman with the issue of blood. But if it wasn't for the cross, Amen. Jesus would be just another great prophet in the Bible, if not the Savior of the world that he is. If it wasn't for the cross... We'd still be under Old Testament law and not under New Testament grace. If it wasn't for the cross and the shedding of Jesus' precious blood, there would be no remission of sins once for all. Amen. So today, I want to bring you a new message on the old rugged cross. Would you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. We're going to start our reading today with verse 1. Now, if you're having trouble finding Mark, it's the second book in the New Testament. It was actually the first gospel that was written, believe it or not. It was written just shortly after Jesus' resurrection. But it's the second book of the New Testament right after Matthew. <clears throat> if you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen with us today. But if you have your Bible and you're at Mark chapter 15 and ready to read, say amen. 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 Oh, that's great. And straightway, thank you. Whoever said that, that very young. I want you to be ready. That's great. Awesome. And straightway in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered, said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witnessed against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast, he, Pilate, released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which was laid bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he would rather release Barabbas <coughs> unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Verse 16. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple, and platted a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with the reed, did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe from him, and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon of Cyrenian who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him into a place called Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, and he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, whatever man should take. Verse 25. 
And it was the third hour when they crucified Him. And the superscription of His accusation was written over the King of the Jews. And with Him they crucified two thieves, the one on the right and the other on the left. And the Scripture was fulfilled which said He was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on Him, wagging their heads, saying, Ah, thou that destroys the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself to come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocked and said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, Himself He cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with Him reviled Him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land till the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him the drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come and take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was written twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, True, this man was the Son of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight this morning. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, you know I'm a very weak man. My voice is weak today, but praise God, you're strong. Father God, I'm going to stand on your promise this morning in your word that if you be high and lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. We're going to lift up the cross today, Father God. And I pray that you would draw everybody to you, the Christians to a closer walk, those that are lost and without you, to a saving relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ. May you save the soul today, right here, that's nearest to hell. And I ask this in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want you to go back with me to the first five words of verse 1. Look at the first five words <coughs> of verse 1. And straightway in the morning. Stop right there. In order to be able to fully understand what's about to happen to Jesus on the morning of His crucifixion, we need to know what happened to Him the night before, okay? The night before was the first day of Passover. And Jesus' disciples were wondering, where are we going to go and eat the Passover meal together? Well, look how Jesus instructed them. Look on the screen back in Mark 14. This is what he said to him. Verse 13. He sendeth forth two of his disciples, said unto them, Go ye into the city, there ye shall meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say to the goodman of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber? Where shall I eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. And his disciples went forth, came into the city, and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. Now guys, this last supper right here is where we get the basis for the Lord's Supper that we observe today. Look, look what happened a little bit later on in verse 22. As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup when he had given thanks. He gave it to them and they drank all of it. And he said, This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. This Last Supper church is also where Jesus declared that one of His disciples would betray Him. And as soon as He said that, all the disciples got really sorrowful, the Bible said. And they went around and said, Is it I? Lord, is it I? Is it I? And Jesus said, It is He that dippeth with me in the dish. And we all know that the one that dipped in the dish with Jesus, the one that betrayed Him, was Judas. We also know that the Last Supper is where Jesus predicted Peter's denial of him. Now, Peter vehemently denied that he would ever deny Jesus. But look what Jesus said to Peter in verse 30 of chapter 14. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. So after Jesus had this discourse with Peter in the upper room, they leave the upper room in the Last Supper, and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus just agonizes over what's about to happen to Him. He's there at the Garden of Gethsemane and He's praying to God and He says, Father, if there's any other way possible for this to happen, let this cup pass from Me. Dr. Luke in his Gospel tells us 
that Jesus was in such agony that when he was praying, he was sweating, and his sweat was as if drops of blood were falling on the ground. But even though Jesus in His full humanity was <coughs> tore up about what He knew was about to happen to Him, in His humble submission to the Father's will, He said, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. And after Jesus got through praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, immediately Judas showed up with a whole band of soldiers to arrest Jesus. Now our studies have shown us that Judas had a cohort of soldiers with him. A cohort of soldiers is one-tenth of a Roman legion. A Roman legion is 6,000 soldiers. Judas had 600 men with him to arrest one man, Jesus Christ. Not a very fair fight, is it? Judas had told the men ahead of time, whoever it is that I shall kiss, that's Jesus. That's the one we're looking for. And sure enough, Judas gets to the Garden of Gethsemane. He sees Jesus. He says, Master, Master. And he kisses him. Now, I need to call a timeout right here real quick, okay? I got a real quick word for somebody here today. Maybe several people. Judas kissed the door of heaven and he still missed it. Amen. Amen. Judas kissed the door of heaven and he still missed it. I submit to you today that there's some of you here at Yellow Creek Baptist Church right now, some of you watching me on the internet right now, and you're going to do the exact same thing. You are kissing the door of heaven by coming here and hanging out with God's people. You are almost there. But just like Judas, you're going to split hell wide open because you have not fully surrendered your life to Him. You've not given up and turned your life completely over to the Father like Jesus did in the garden. You've not said, Lord, not my will, but Thine be done. You've not turned over full control of your life to the Lord. You still want to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, with who you want to do it. You're holding on to that pet sin in your life. You're holding on to that bitterness and that hatred, and you don't want to give it up. You've not admitted that you are a sinner that needs a Savior. You've not confessed Him as Lord and Savior of your life. You've not repented of your sins and asked to forgive for forgiveness. You have kissed the door of heaven by being here at church today. Amen. But being at church don't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. That's right. <laughs> Think about that just for a second. You're still totally lost. And you're going to split hell wide open unless you fully surrender to Jesus. Now let's get back to the context of the night of Jesus' crucifixion. After Judas kissed Jesus, they arrested Him. And the Bible says that they laid hands on Him. Now this is what that means, guys. When they laid hands on Him, that means that they roughed Him up after they arrested Him. They pushed Him around. They slapped Him. And they hit Him as they led Him away. They take Jesus to Caiaphas' house. Caiaphas is the high priest. And the chief priests and the elders and the scribes, they hold an illegal trial. It was illegal, folks. Because the trial was at night, which was completely against Jewish law. It was illegal because the ones who arrested Jesus were also his judges. Pretend just for a second that Trooper Moore over here arrests you for something. And he takes you to jail. Then you go to see the judge and you get there and Trooper Moore's the judge. Lord help. Lord help. That's right. How fair is that going to be? But that's exactly... What was going on to Jesus here? The trial was also illegal, guys, because the chief priests weren't seeking the truth. The Bible says they were seeking false witnesses. It was illegal because the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, they had absolutely no jurisdiction in a capital case. The Bible says that only the Romans could sentence people to die according to Jewish law. Just like today, capital cases were not to be sentenced on the same day as the trial. For example, you have a trial today, and somebody's found guilty. Well, at a later date, they'll have a sentencing hearing when that person will be sentenced. Same thing here, but they didn't do it. They sentenced Jesus on the same day that they found him guilty. And lastly, guys, this trial was illegal because those on trial were not supposed to be mistreated, but was my Jesus Amen. ever Amen. mistreated 
After they found him guilty, all you know what broke loose. The Bible says that they spit on him. The Bible says that they put a blindfold on Jesus where he couldn't see. They'd come up to him and they'd slap him and they'd hit him and they'd say, prophesy to us, Jesus. Who is it that just hit you? Did Jesus deserve any of this? Absolutely not. And it was during this time that this was going on that Peter denied him. Peter was out there warming himself by a fire. And three different times he denied that he knew Jesus. And on the last time that he denied him, he began to cuss and to swear that he didn't know who Jesus was. And for those of you that struggle with your language, <clears throat> when you cuss and swear, you may think you're all big and bad and that you're cool. But in reality, the Bible says that cussing and swearing is a sign that you're denying Christ. Amen. Just like Peter did. I want you to think about the next time a cuss word comes out of your mouth. Immediately, as soon as Peter cussed, the rooster crowed. That's right. Announcing it was morning. Peter remembered what Jesus had said earlier. Before the rooster crows twice, you shall deny me thrice. And it tore Peter all to pieces. And the Bible says that he ran out and he wept bitterly. That brings us to verse 1 of our passage today. Morning's broken. It's the morning of Jesus' crucifixion. And the full council of the religious leaders convened and they all agreed to sentence Jesus to death. But there's just one big problem. Like I said earlier, they do not have the legal authority to execute somebody. So they delivered Jesus to the Roman official that's in charge of the region. He was a man by the name of Pilate. Now, the chief priest knew that Pilate wouldn't put Jesus to death for the reasons that they wanted him to put him to death. So instead, they made up a bunch of junk on Jesus. Right. We learn in the other Gospels that they accused Jesus of things he was completely innocent of. They accused Jesus of encouraging others not to pay their taxes to Rome. They accused Jesus of stirring up the people and claiming to be a king. And when Pilate heard the part about claiming to be the king, he looked at Jesus and he said, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, Thou sayest it. Well, as soon as Jesus said that, guys, it fired up the chief priest. And they commenced to uh, accuse him and accuse him and accuse him even more of all kind of ludicrous stuff. Trying to get Pilate to execute him. And this whole time, they were accusing Jesus. He just kept quiet. Right. He didn't say a word. Didn't open his mouth. This very event with Jesus keeping his mouth shut, was prophesied hundreds of years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. Look on the screen at Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Right. Even though the chief priests were saying all kind of bad and untrue things about Jesus, even though he had every right to defend himself, Jesus didn't say a word. He kept completely quiet. You know what, church? <laughs> you and I would be better off a whole lot of times if we just kept our mouth shut. Amen. Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. That means we need to listen twice as much as we talk. Brother Philip has got himself in a bunch of trouble over the years for opening his big mouth. So the next time you get ready to say something, take a half a second and just think before you speak. Amen? Man, that was a really good time for you to amen. You missed the boat right there, guys. Next time she says, how do I look in this dress? Think before you speak. In verse 5, we learn that Jesus' silence absolutely amazed Pilate. The Bible says that Pilate marveled because he had never seen a prisoner like this before. Usually what would happen, the people would be accusing, the prisoners would say, I didn't do that. Yes, you did. I didn't do that. Yes, you did. And it would go back and forth. <coughs> Not this time. Jesus was completely silent. And this absolutely amazed Pilate because he had never seen a prisoner like this. Now, you need to know this next part. Between verse 5 of Mark chapter 15 and verse 6 of Mark chapter 15. Something happened that's only recorded in Luke's gospel. Pilate was trying his dead level best to pass the buck on what to do with Jesus. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. He could see right through the false accusations of the chief priest. 
But Pilate wanted to keep the peace. He did not want to make a decision on Jesus. And so, during this time that they were accusing Jesus, Pilate heard them say something about Jesus being from Galilee. And as soon as he heard that, he said, Whoa, 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 you from Galilee? And he thought he had an out. Because the ruler of Galilee just happened to be in Jerusalem at the same time. There was a guy named Herod. So he said, I'll send Jesus over to Herod and hope that Herod takes care of things. Now, I need to call another time out right here real quick, church. Listen up. There's no passing the buck when it comes to making a decision on Jesus. Amen. Your mom and dad cannot make a decision for you. Your husband and your wife cannot make the decision for you. Amen. Your grandparents cannot make the decision for you. Your boss cannot make the decision for you. You and you alone have to make your own decision over what to do with Jesus Christ in your life. And if you try to do what Pilate did here and not make a decision at all, friends, that counts as a no vote. And all no votes end up spending eternity in hell when they die, okay? Amen. I just want you to know what happens when you get a yes vote or a no vote, okay? So Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. And more of the same takes place. Herod asks Jesus questions. Jesus keeps quiet. The chief priest vehemently accused Jesus. Jesus keeps quiet. Herod and his men taught Jesus and mock him. Jesus keeps quiet. And so Herod sends Jesus right back to Pilate. Well, this time, Pilate decides he's going to take a different approach to dealing with Jesus and trying to pass the buck on him. It was a tradition at this time, that at the Passover, that Pilate would release a prisoner to the Jews. And so Pilate gave the Jews two choices. He says, do you want me to release Jesus? Or would you rather me release this man called Barabbas? Now, Barabbas, guys was an interesting and colorful character to say the least. We know for a fact he was a murderer. Many people think that he was a false messiah trying to overthrow Rome, the Romans in Jerusalem. But either way, never in a million years did Pilate guess That's right. that they would pick the rats over Jesus. Never in a million years did he think that would happen. And I understand why. Think about it, church. Just a few days before... Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Everybody lined the streets, waved palm branches, throw their clothes down in the way and said, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Just a few hours earlier, Jesus had been teaching in the temple and they had huge crowds all around him. I know completely why Paul thought there was no way that they picked Barabbas over Jesus because Jesus' popularity was at an all-time high. But the chief priest guys were crazy. And they were so crazy and consumed with getting rid of Jesus that they stirred up the people. Right. And they convinced the people to ask for the murderer Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus. Now guys, this was insane. Barabbas was a menace to society. Jesus never harmed anybody. Barabbas was trying to be a political messiah. Jesus was the real deal, spiritual messiah. Barabbas wanted to save the Jews from Rome. Jesus wanted to save the sins of the whole world. Barabbas wanted to shed other people's blood to accomplish his mission. Jesus wanted to shed his own blood to accomplish his mission. The decision was crystal clear. Just like our decision to accept Jesus today is Amen. crystal clear. Amen. But just like many people today make the wrong choice, the mob of people here in Jerusalem at Passover made the wrong choice. And they chose to have Barabbas released instead of Jesus. This totally shocked Pilate. And so once again, he tried to shift the decision on what to do with Jesus to somebody else. He asked the crowd in verse 12, What shall I do to him? He called king of the Jews. The mob answered verse 13, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate pleaded with the crowd and said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept crying out more, Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. And then look what the Bible says in verse 15. Two things I don't want you to miss. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. First thing you need to catch out of this church. Many times the right thing to do is not the most popular thing to do. Right. Young people, I want you to listen to me and I want you to get that. Many times the right thing to do is not always 
the most popular thing to do. Without question, clearly, the right thing for Pilate to do in this situation was to release Jesus because Jesus was an innocent man. But releasing Jesus was not the popular thing to do. And so Pilate caved in to public opinion. And he had Jesus scourged and crucified. Friends, I submit to you today that the same thing is true for many of the decisions that we make. The right thing to do is not always the most popular thing to do. Our society has become immersed in public opinion polls today. You turn on the news and within five minutes you'll hear a report on the latest CNN, Wall Street Journal, Fox News poll about the president's job performance, what they think about Obamacare, what they think about legalizing marijuana, what they think about same-sex marriage, what they think about the economy. And our politicians are absolutely glued to these polls and they're using them to govern. That's right. That's right. This book right here is how we should govern our society. That's right. That's right. This book right here is how we should live our lives. It's worked for the past 2,000 years. Why in the world do we need to stop using it now? If you do what the Bible says, it works when you stay abstinent until you get married. It works when you do what the Bible says and take care of your bodies like they're the temple of the Holy Spirit. It works when you do what the Bible says and don't steal, lie, commit adultery, or murder. It works, men, when you love your wife as Christ loved the church. It works, ladies, when you try to win your husband with your actions and not nagging him all the time. It works, kids, when you honor your father and your mother. It works when you tithe and give 10% to the local church and then let Jesus meet all the rest of your needs. It works when you praise God in everything, including the hard times of life. Friends, living your life according to the teachings of God's holy word flat out works. Amen. It's worked for years. And it will continue to work for the rest of eternity regardless of what public opinion says. If you've been trying to live your life the world's way and it's just not working out, Try living your life the way your Creator, God Almighty, intended for you to live. Amen. Live it according to the Bible, and you will finally see once and for all how life is supposed to be lived. Remember, church, the right thing to do and the right way to live is not always the most popular thing to do and the most popular way to live. The second thing that the Lord wants you to take away from this verse today, I want you to look at this word right here. Scourge. Scourge. It's eight letters. It's one word. <coughs> but it does not even begin right. to describe what happened to Jesus next. As y'all may or may not know, my wife is a member of the Christian Medical and Dental Association. And a few years ago, the Christian Medical and Dental Association published a paper that gave a full medical description of what Jesus went through when He was scourged. Jesus is stripped of His clothing and His hands are tied to a post above His head. The Roman legionnaire steps forward with the flagrum in His hand. It's a short whip consisting of heavy leather thongs with two small balls of lead attached near the ends of each. The heavy whip is brought down with full force again and again and again and again across Jesus' shoulders, his back, and his legs. At first, the heavy thongs cut through the skin only. Then as the blows continue, they are cut deeper into the subcutaneous tissues producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. The small balls of lead first produce large, deep bruises, which are broken open by subsequent blows. Finally, Jesus' skin on his back is just hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. When it's determined by the centurion in charge that Jesus is near death, the beating is finally stopped. The half-fainting Jesus is untied and allowed to slump to the stone pavement, wet in his own blood. The 
the scourging of Jesus was absolutely horrific. And it makes me sick at my stomach. Under no circumstances did the king of the universe deserve to go through that. <coughs> but what's really bad is what I just read to you doesn't even scratch the surface of what was about to happen next. After Jesus was scourged, they took him into a large hall and they stripped him of all his clothes. Now that hurt his back again from the scourging he just had. They put a scarlet robe on him, again hurting the wounds from the scourging. They put together a crown to put on his head, and it would have been bad enough to make him a fake, a fake crown of, of sagebrush or of twigs or of vines or branches, but it wasn't that. It was a crown made of thorns. And they placed that crown on Jesus' head and the thorns went into his scalp and it caused him even more pain and even more bleeding. And after they did that, they mocked him. And they bowed down before him there with that scarlet robe and that crown on him. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews! Can you imagine Jesus standing there, bloody, weak, humiliated, beat all to pieces, and now they're mocking him. As if the physical pain wasn't bad enough, the emotional pain was just almost unbearable. It gets worse. In verse 18, it says they took a reed. And this ain't some little reed that's next to the creed. The reed in those days was a stick. They took a stick and they beat him upside the head with that stick. The stick on the head hits the crown of thorns. The thorns go into his head even worse. More pain. More beating. More bleeding. They spit on Jesus some more. The Bible says they mocked him some more. Then they took that purple robe back off of him, hurting his back again. They put his own clothes back on him, and then they led Jesus away to be crucified. Jesus leaves the hall where they were mocking him, and he travels down the Via Dolorosa to Golgotha. Now it was customary during this time, guys, that a person being crucified would have to carry their cross to the crucifixion site. And they had to do this as a deterrent. Because people would see that person going down the street with the cross and they say to them, you do what he did, you'll end up like he did. Jesus fell beneath the weight of that heavy cross. And the Bible says that the soldiers in charge compelled a man by the name of Simon from Cyrene in northern Africa to carry Jesus' cross for him the rest of the way. Simon had made this trip to Jerusalem for the Passover, and I'm, I'm positive that the last thing Simon ever dreamed he would be doing on this once-in-a-lifetime trip to Jerusalem, the last thing he ever thought he'd be doing was carrying a cross for Jesus. Can I give somebody a word here right now? Listen up, i got a word for you. What happened to Simon is just like life today. Many times at the snap of a finger, just like that, the twinkling of an eye, suddenly, quickly, we get hit with a cross that we have to carry. That's right. It may be a bad health report. It may be your spouse coming in and saying, hey, I don't love you anymore. It may be a job loss. It may be some other devastating financial news. It may be bad news concerning a family member. Whatever it is, these crosses can come on us just like that. That's right. But we got to be prepared. we got to be ready to carry it. When they fall on us, just like Simon was ready for Jesus. So they bring Jesus to Golgotha, and before they nail him to the cross, they try to give him this narcotic drink as kind of a sedation to numb the pain, but Jesus refused it. He wouldn't have any of it. He wanted to endure the pain of the cross fully. And my oh my, how painful that was going to be. 
crucifixion was so bad that the Romans would not even allow another Roman citizen to be crucified. It was and is the most painful and worst possible way for a man to die. The exact same Christian publication that told us the medical description of the scourging gives us a medical description of the crucifixion. Jesus is thrown backward with his shoulders against the wood, again causing more pain from the scourging. The legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of the wrist, and he drives a heavy, square, wrought iron nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some flexibility and movement. The left foot is pressed backwards against the right foot, and with both feet extended, toes down, a nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. Jesus is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails in the wrist, excruciating, fiery pain shoots along the fingers, up the arms to explode in his brain. As he pushes himself upward to avoid this wrenching torment, he places his full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, there's the searing agony tearing through the nerves between the bones of his feet. At this point, another phenomenon occurs as his arms fatigue Great waves of cramp sweep over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, air can be drawn into the lungs, but it cannot be exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself up in order to get even one short breath. Jesus endures six hours of this limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-rending cramps, intermittent partial asphyxiation, searing pain as tissue is torn from his back as he moves up and down against the rough timber. Then another agony begins. A deep crushing pain deep in the chest of his pericardium occurs as it fills slowly with serum and begins to compress his heart. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissue. The tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to draw in small gulps of air. And the markedly dehydrated tissues send their flood of stimuli to Jesus' brain. Does this make anybody besides me sick at their stomach to try to even imagine what happened to Jesus when He was crucified? It was disgusting and it was sickening. People today try to romanticize the cross paint these beautiful pictures of what it looked like on the cross. Let me tell you something, friend. You don't want to know what it looked like because it's the worst thing you would ever lay your eyes on. It was unimaginably horrible. <coughs> worst of all, this wasn't all of it. Look at verse 24. When they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them what every man should take. Did I mention that Jesus was stark naked as He hung there on the cross? Stark naked. The Bible tells us in 24 that when they crucified Him and they nailed Him to the cross, the soldiers had His clothes. They were gambling for His garments. Jesus hung there without a stitch of clothes on, completely naked. How much more humiliating can you get? Verse 25 tells us they placed Jesus on the cross at 9 o'clock. Verse 27 says there were two thieves crucified with Jesus, one on each side, fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. Verse 29 tells us that more mocking took place as the people uh, came by on the road mocked him. Verse 31 says that the chief priest and the scribes joined in on this mocking too. And they said something that was actually the truth, but they meant it in a mocking way. I want you to look what they said here in verse 31. He saved others himself. He cannot save. Now, this does not mean that Jesus didn't have the ability to save himself. 
We know that at any time he could have called 12 legions of angels to come down from heaven and rescue him from the cross. But Jesus could not save himself if he were going to save others. That's right. What incredible, unselfish love that Christ exhibited toward us. Jesus could have avoided the cross. He could have avoided all the torture of the cross at any time. But He didn't avoid it because of how much He loved us. Amen. That's unbelievable. There was more mocking. In verse 32, the chief priest asked Jesus to come down from the cross by saying, if you'll come down now, we'll believe that you're really the Christ. Now that might sound good on the surface, but let me tell you why it wasn't true. They didn't believe the signs of His resurrection three days later. So why in the world do you think they'd believe this sign if He came down from the cross? They wouldn't have believed Him, and Jesus knew they wouldn't believe Him. Verse 33 says that three hours after He was placed on the cross, at noon, total darkness came over the whole land until He died at 3 o'clock. Verse 34 says that at 3 o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice from the cross, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? This was a direct quote from Psalms 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There's another word for somebody here today. When you're in pain, do like Jesus did and quote Scripture. When you're hurting, when you're in pain, do like Jesus did and quote Scripture. When Jesus was at His lowest and in the most pain on the cross, He quoted Scripture. Right. And you and I would do very well if we memorized Scripture to quote when we're in tough situations. Now don't sit there and look at me like I'm from another planet by asking you to memorize Scripture. Listen, if you can memorize all the statistics and all the names of your favorite players on your favorite ball team, if you can memorize all the things that you have to memorize for your job at work, if you can memorize all that you need to memorize about deer hunting, fishing, looking at cars, or whatever else your hobby is, then give me one good reason why you can't memorize Scripture to help you get through the tough times of life. Amen. You can do it. And just like with Jesus, that Scripture you memorize will help you through the really tough times of life. Verse 37, Jesus gives up the ghost and dies, and he really does die. He wasn't passed out. He wasn't asleep. He was dead. Amen. Jesus was totally and completely dead. These were professional Roman soldiers. They knew what dead people looked like. They had performed thousands of crucifixions. And we have their testimony and the testimony of everybody else. That Jesus really did die. Right. What happened when he died? There was a great earthquake. Verse 38 says that the temple, uh, the veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Not from the bottom to a, the top like a man did it, but from the top to the bottom like Almighty God did it. The Holy of the Holies was the most sacred place in the temple. It was where the high priest went once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people. But now, that direct access would not be limited to one man on one day of the year. Every single one of us had direct access to the Father God Almighty through the death of the Son, Jesus Christ. And here's what that means for you. No longer do we have to go through the priestly and sacrificial system of the Old Testament. No longer do you have to call the priest to get through to God. Now that Jesus has died on the cross... We have direct access to God anytime through praying in Jesus' name. We can pray anywhere, at any time, whenever, wherever. We have direct access to the unlimited power of the Creator of the universe. How awesome is that? Amen. The Bible says if you just have the faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you can pray for that mountain to be moved and it will be moved. The Bible says if two of us shall agree on earth, touching anything that we shall ask, it shall be done for us from our Father that's in heaven. And friend, we got this direct access to the power of the Father only by the death of His Son, Jesus yeah. Christ, on the cross. That's right. <clears throat> Which brings me to the last verse today, and I'm going to close and be through. Verse 39. Verse 39 tells us that the about the centurion in charge of the crucifixion. <clears throat> when the centurion saw everything that happened to Jesus... When he saw the darkness that covered the earth for three hours, when he witnessed the earthquake, when he witnessed the manner in which Jesus just gave up the ghost and died, look at what he declared at the very end of verse 39. Truly, this man was the Son of God. That's right. Truly, this man was the Son of God. 
the centurion believed that Jesus was the Son of God based on the facts that he witnessed with his own eyes. So what do you believe? What do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus was really God's Son like the centurion believed? Do you believe that Jesus really did die on the cross just like what I preached today? Do you believe that He really did live a perfect life all 33 years He was on earth even though the Bible says He was tempted in all ways as we are? Do you believe that He is the only way to heaven just like He said He was in John 14? Now I see a whole bunch of you shaking your heads right now that you believe that. That is fantastic. But i got some news for you. Even the demons in hell believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You've got to do more than believe, friend. You've got to admit that you're a sinner that needs a Savior. If you don't understand that you're a sinner, then why in the world do you need somebody to save you? You've got to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life and repent of your sinful ways. I want you to look at the last verse of Scripture today, Romans 10, 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Have you done this? I'm just asking. Hold on. Have you done this? Have you admitted that you're a sinner that needs a Savior? Have you believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? Have you confessed Him as Lord and Savior of your life and repented of your sins? If you've never done that, then you are no different that Judas that betrayed Jesus. Right. You have kissed the door of heaven today. That's right. But instead of going to your eternal destination in heaven, your eternal destination will be in hell. That's right. Friend, I want to ask you, and the Father wants you today, to get right with God right now while you still have the chance. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, there's no greater message ever preached than the message of the cross. And I'm so thankful, Father God, for what You did on the cross. Lord, I want You to know, from the bottom of my heart, I am sorry for the sins that I have committed that You forgave me on the cross. I'm sorry for my part of what You went through on the cross. I know I really wasn't there, but I know it was because of my sins that You went. And I'm thankful, God, that you love me that much. And I'm sorry. <coughs> Lord, I love you. And I thank you for what you did. Father God, I pray that if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that's never accepted you as Savior and um, accepted what you did for them on the cross, Pray, Lord, that they'll do it right now while they have the chance to do it. 